We begin tonight with breaking news. San Antonio police and EMS responding to this rollover crash at Babcock Road and Northwest Loop 410. You can see it involves an SAPD vehicle that rolled over. It all happened uh, just about 30 minutes ago when this video was taken from Sky 12. That crash happening just before 530. We'll update you with more information once it becomes available. Now to those holiday woes that continue today all across the country and right here at home. The San Antonio International Airport had 29 cancellations here alone from noon yesterday to noon today. But flight cancellations are the root cause of a list of frustrations for travelers. Another issue is people being separated from their luggage. John Paul Barajas is at baggage claim tonight at the airport. How's it looking over there right now? Tim, still lots of people looking for their bags tonight, but a significant difference from a few nights ago when bags were literally covering the entire floor space between conveyor belts. That being said, there are still lots of large piles of unclaimed bags or lost bags, uh, even still a lot more than usual, according to the baggage service office. Now, one family is trying to avoid having this problem as well as trying to get home. But she got a uh, carry on because she's like so worried because all everybody's losing luggage and stuff like that. And we don't fly Alaskan like ever. So she was like, OK, I'll just go on a limb and do that because Southwest has been so difficult. Southwest has canceled more than 2,500 flights for today and tomorrow, which is more than 60% of their flight schedule, according to Flight Aware. In a statement, Southwest says, with consecutive days of extreme winter weather across our network behind us, continuing challenges are impacting our customers and employees in a significant way that is unacceptable. And our heartfelt apologies for this are just the beginning, or are just in the beginning. The CEO also said that they are going to be considering taking on additional charges that people have incurred while trying to navigate these travel woes as Tim said, whether that was hotels, food, anything else like that. So it may be a good idea to hold on to your receipts because everyone we've spoken to so far says getting a hold of Southwest has been extremely difficult. Tim. An historic meltdown for that airline. And tonight we are hearing from the president of Southwest Pilots Association. As our sister station KPRC tells us, he's calling the luggage situation embarrassing. What went wrong is that our IT infrastructure for our scheduling software is uh, vastly outdated. It can't handle the number of pilots, flight attendants that we have in the system uh, with our complex route network. Now we're tired of apologizing for, for Southwest, the pilots of, of uh, the airline, and um, our hearts go out to all of our passengers. Now to the latest on the winter storm in the Northeast. At least 52 people across the country have died as a result of that storm. Officials in New York say it is the deadliest blizzard there in 50 years. Some of the victims have been found dead in snow banks and in cars. A group of people in New York has been using snowmobiles to save dozens of stranded residents, including one man who was stuck on the side of the road for over 19 hours. And these guys were helping people and he said he knew a place he could take us and he will help us out. I guess God said the angel. And tonight officials in western New York say they are preparing now for possible flooding later in the week as temperatures there rise and the snow begins to melt rapidly. We've thought out here in the past couple days. We've still had those cold mornings, Adam, but much warmer afternoons. Yeah, Tim, six days in a row, San Antonio had a temperature at or below freezing. That streak ends tonight and into tomorrow. We started the day at 32 degrees briefly, a light freeze earlier this morning, and then we topped out at 60 this afternoon with that sunshine, both being below average. And you'll still feel a chill in the air late tonight and early tomorrow. By 10 o'clock, it'll be 45, midnight about 41 degrees, but then around sunrise tomorrow when we typically hit our low, 38 for the low, even into the hill country will be a little above freezing. So a nice change of pace and we can actually put the potted plants back outdoors again. I'm waiting till tomorrow midday, but at least we can get them back outside again. A warming trend is on the way, even warmer temperatures. We'll talk about that and just how warm it's going to get even into the upcoming holiday weekend in just a bit. All right, we'll see you then, Adam. A fire over on the southwest side today destroying a house. It happened in the 6100 block of Lawn Valley Drive. But as Garrett Berger tells us, the man inside is blaming dogs for the blaze. The fire completely destroyed this home. You can check inside and see that there is nothing left. A woman claiming to be the homeowner showed up on site, though, and said that the person staying here was not actually supposed to be here. 
The San Antonio Fire Department said their unit showed up to this house being fully involved already. They had to fight to keep the flames off the houses to either side, though one of them did get damaged, but the owner there will be able to stay. Here at the main house, though, the fire department says a man and two dogs inside got out safely. Here's what he had to say about how it started. It was just a round heater that has flames around it, and I guess they threw the blanket over it, and that's what caught on fire. You said they threw it over? Yeah, the dogs. He claims that was an electric heater, though both he and the woman claiming to be the homeowner say there was no power. People who were here with the purported homeowner told us CPS Energy had said the meter had been tampered with. That man told us he had permission from his son to be here, but he didn't know what his son's arrangement with the property owners was. Now the purported homeowner told us no one was supposed to be renting this home. On the far north southwest side, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. To other stories we've been following today, tonight San Antonio police still searching for the suspect involved in a shooting near downtown. It happened just before 630 yesterday at Hayes and Hackberry streets. Officers say the 19 year old victim told them he was sitting in his car when someone shot him. He says then someone uh, he, he was hit once and someone drove him to a nearby hospital. That man is expected to survive his injuries. Police say the man's car was shot three times. No information right now about the shooter or a description of them. Two residents have lost their home after a fire at an apartment complex over on the city's west side. This fire happened around 930 last night in the 1700 block of Castroville Road. That's near Highway 90 and South San Joaquin Avenue. Firefighters say they arrived to flames coming out of the building. Officials say it started in one of the units and then spread to the attic. No injuries were reported. The Red Cross was called to help the people who were displaced. The cause of that fire still under investigation. Around Texas now, the Texas National Guard has installed over two miles of fencing since the first few feet of border fencing went up in El Paso just last week. According to Texas National Guard spokesman, more fencing is expected to be installed. Meanwhile, as of Monday, approximately 22,000 migrants were sleeping in shelters and makeshift encampments across three northern Mexico cities, a number that is only expected to grow as Title 42 remains in legal limbo leaving thousands of migrants to make the decision to either wait for the Trump era pandemic policy to be lifted or to cross into the United States illegally. I've seen uh, weed eaters, uh, piece of lawn, uh, pieces of lawn mowers, um, rims, hubcaps, a bunch of different of everything. That's what's not supposed to be here. Today we're talking about what should be not only what can be recycled, but what's accepted at the recycling facility, because there is a very big difference. Plus, organics. What should go in in San Antonio's green and blue bins? We answer that big question and show you what happens to all that stuff after it leaves your curb. It's a case that explains coming up at 630. Take a look at traffic out there tonight on this Tuesday. Still a lot of people off, but uh, a trouble spot over there at I-35 in Weedner tonight. Some flashing lights there as they work to clear a situation over there. Now, if you're planning on getting out on the streets to make any road trips in the coming days, Traffic Authority Stephen Cavazos has a look at some of the latest road closures around the city. The road work is wrapping up for 2022, but we can expect to see the work continue in 2023. Yeah, we have a few things going on. Let's talk about Wurzbach Parkway for a moment. Road work will continue at least up until New Year's Eve, and we can probably expect some of the work to continue into the early days of next year. But uh, the work begins at 9 in the morning and should wrap around 3 in the afternoon. Drivers, during that time, you will see alternating lane closures in both directions from Blanco Road to Thousand Oaks Drive. Now, let's take a drive over here to Loop 1604 this time on the northeast side of San Antonio, where striping and barrier work will continue on Tuesday, January 3rd, wraps up on Saturday, January 7th. That's at least a portion of it. Uh, it is overnight, so 9 in the evening to 5 in the morning. That's when drivers will see alternating lane closures on Loop 1604 eastbound from Nacogdoches Road to I-35. One last look here along FM 2252 Nacogdoches Road. Bridge work will continue on Thursday, January 5th and wrap on Friday, January 6th. Pretty brief. 9 in the evening to 5 in the morning is from when drivers will see full closures of lanes in both directions right there at the Evan Road intersection. All right, so scan this QR code if you want to stay updated with all the current closures that are happening right now in and around the Alamo City. But for now, safe travels into the new year. New year. 
Still ahead on the news at six, we are going front and center with a group of Air Force military training instructors, how they're celebrating their Hispanic heritage in a powerful way. The holiday woes continue. Thousands of flights have been canceled southwest leading the charge. Coming up, an updated statement from the airline. We also speak with those traveling or trying to travel right here at our airport. I'm Dylan Collier on the night beat. Bear County jailers using force to subdue inmates. It happened a whole lot last year, but those numbers in 2022 are way down. We explain why. Plus, the shortage of home care workers can put the most vulnerable in a desperate situation. We break down why the reason for the shortage is not related to a lack of staff willing to work, but the money available for that work. Front and center, this morning a group of Air Force military training instructors who are celebrating their Hispanic heritage in a subtle yet powerful way. Jonathan Cotto introduces us to an all Latino flag security detail who say diversity, inclusion and representation truly matters. Master Sergeant Adriana Romero was born in Bogota, Colombia. She immigrated to the U.S. with her parents in 1999. As a child, I always was infatuated with the uniform and everything that had to do with the military. Adriana Romero. It was her father who encouraged her to enlist and serve her new country. Hey, you know, you're in the United States of America, you have an opportunity, you should join. In retrospect, I started thinking about it and I thought, why not pay it forward to the country that adopted me? For Staff Sergeant Karina Flores, joining the ranks of the United States Air Force was a far-fetched dream. Her Mexican mother having a very different view on her daughter's future. But it was very hard for my mom at first um, because she did just want me to stay home and, of course, take care of the husband and, you know, just be that traditional Hispanic woman. But I knew I was destined for something more. Against all odds, nearly seven and a half years later, she is where she is supposed to be serving her country. And so they're super proud of me and definitely having them come out to my graduations, they get a feel for why I love doing what I do and they see that I'm impacting young airmen's lives, I'm making that difference for them. Kimberly Quick says she grew up in a very diverse neighborhood. Very mixed. It was never, you know, just one predominant ethnicity or anything like that. But when I came to the Air Force, that's when I started to realize there's certain people that are treated better. There's certain people that have to fight for what they want. And that's exactly what Quick did. She worked hard, just like her parents taught her growing up and understood her representation mattered. As a Latina, I am representing and I am setting that standard of, hey, we're in a new world and we're here and hello, you're gonna get used to us and we're gonna you know, be as successful as everybody regardless of your race, color, background, anything like that. This all-American, all-Latino flag security detail, retiring the colors looking towards a future that continues to celebrate not only our differences, but also what unites us. Diversity is a beautiful thing. If we all look the same and if we all came from the same background, it would be a really boring world. Retire the color. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And we certainly thank them and all of our service members for their service to our nation. Adam, we certainly uh, thank the weather for cooperating here the last few days as well, too. Yeah, not too bad around here. And we had our cold snap, but luckily no precipitation to go with it and get in the way. And I do want to point out that our streak of freezing temperatures is coming to an end. We're going to be above freezing starting tonight and lasting through the at least the next seven days foreseeable foreseeable future 70s are just around the corner. Before you know it, temperatures will be at or above 70. And also no chapped lips. If you've been annoyed by dry skin chapped lips because of that very dry air, that all changes in just a day or two. Tomorrow morning we're at 38 degrees, but by Thursday morning up to 58. And then we'll be in a stretch of mornings anywhere from near 50 to into the 50s. So a noticeable change on the way. Let's talk about the big picture. And remember when we had those temperatures well below zero? I mean, we were talking double digits below zero. Often the northern portion of the lower 48 here, that's not the case anymore. Temperatures have moderated all across the U.S. And closer to home here, we're in the 50s. 57 in Hondo, Seguin, New Braunfels, 53. Burning down to 52, 
Kelly Field right now measuring 54 degrees and SA International at 56. So we'll cool off and then by tomorrow morning, upper 30s, even in the hill country, I think we'll be above freezing. Then by the afternoon, getting in that sunshine right around 70, even into the 70s farther west. Floresville, Pleasanton about 74, Helotus 68. Bandera, Pipe Creek area about 68, the high temperature, and then it gets even warmer uh, by Thursday, lower 70s. But Friday through the weekend, we're into the 70s. And I think our warmest point here going forward is on Sunday, 77 degrees. So some locations, especially south of town, likely to hit 80 degrees by Sunday. Our cold snap and this hard freeze will just be a thing of the past by New Year's Eve and New Year's Day even. And that's also gonna to lead to some comfortable nights and mornings. There will be a little influx of moisture, which is gonna get rid of the chapped lips issue. Dew points right now, 20s and 30s. But remember, just uh, several days ago, our dew points were down below zero, which indicates very dry air. Some of the driest air we really see around here in South Central Texas. This all changes as dew points gradually rise with that wind out of the south and coming off the Gulf of Mexico. Throughout the day tomorrow, notice how these numbers rise into the 50s. So dew points in the low 50s, even some mid 50s. And then by Thursday, we're talking dew points low 60s. So you'll actually feel a bit of mugginess return to the air by Thursday. It'll feel a little sticky outside. All right, let's talk rainfall and any potential thereof. Uh, we're dry right now. We've got these mid and high clouds moving overhead, making for that sp spectacular sunset we just had. Big stories off in the West Coast now. This is where we have atmospheric rivers coming on shore, basically plumes of very high moisture content, muggy, humid air coming in, saturated air coming in from the Pacific. And that's leading to all this precipitation in the West Coast and higher elevation snow in parts of the Rockies. But otherwise, it's quiet right now. And unfortunately, we're not going to tap in to any of that good moisture that's off to the West. We have a few chances of a few light showers. I mean, we're talking 20% here and there on Thursday, mainly east of town, closer to the Gulf Coast. I mean, we're talking Lavaca County, DeWitt County, Carnes County. You could have a few showers here and there on Thursday. We'll give it about 20% chance for us. And then we get into Monday and we're looking at a 20% chance of some morning storms. I think that's the best we can do tomorrow. Areas of fog early, some reduced visibility on the roadways early in the morning just for a few hours. 38 degrees at 7 a.m. By noon, we start to see the sun at 62 and then 4 o'clock, 70 degrees with that south southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. I do want to point out Thursday morning with that noticeable humidity that should lead to some thicker fog. I wouldn't be surprised if we have dense fog visibilities a half mile or even less early Thursday morning and then just a gray day the rest of the day. But remaining warm near 70 into this weekend. Look at that for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Sunny 70s and just comfortable conditions out there. Looking good. Thank you, Adam. All right, Larry, at five o'clock, we saw a shot of the river rally taking place for the Alamo Bowl. So we're what, two days away now? Two days away. Yeah, Alamo Bowl between Texas and Washington. And today we had a chance to talk to Longhorns quarterback Quinn Ewers, who was talking about his head coach, Steve Sarkeesian, who used to be a pretty good quarterback himself. Plus, in the NBA, the Spurs are closing in on the NBA attendance record for a single game coming up. The Spurs are in Oklahoma City getting ready for their seventh of 14 back-to-back -back games this season. The Spurs are 2-5 in the opening game and 1-5 and in the closing contest. Last night, San Antonio beat the Jazz 126-122 to snap a two-game losing streak. The Spurs led by as many as 20 points in the third quarter, then held off a late fourth-quarter rally from the Jazz. During post-game, fifth-year forward Kelton Johnson was asked, how long does it take for a vet to trust a rookie? Obviously, it takes a little bit because we're not used to playing with them, but, you know, um, we got some good rookies, you know, they, they, they willing to learn and uh, they ask a lot of questions and um, they just keep continue to get better and better. Just quick, quick to uh, gain their trust because, you know, they play hard, they compete um, and they want to learn and, and win. 
Thunder will host the Spurs tonight at 7. Keldon is listed as questionable with low back tightness, and Doug McDermott is also questionable with right knee soreness. The Spurs today announced that ticket sales have surpassed 50,000 for the team's return to the Alamo Dome on January 13th. With this 50,000 ticket milestone, the game is set to be the fourth time in NBA history a crowd has topped 50K, and the Spurs are fast approaching the previous NBA record of 62,046 set by the Atlanta Hawks when they hosted the Chicago Bulls in 1998. We are getting closer to the Valero Alamo Bowl between number 21 Texas and number 12 Washington. The Longhorns are practicing at Trinity University and looking to win their third Alamo Bowl in the last four seasons. Today we got to talk with some of the offensive guys like quarterback Quinn Ewers and wide receiver Xavier Worthy. Ewers was asked about his relationship with head coach Steve Sarkeesian, a very good QB himself back in the day. And it was also mentioned to him that the last time Washington was in the Alamo Bowl was in 2011 when Sark was the Huskies head coach and they lost a high scoring game to Baylor 67 to 50. So does Ewers expect another high-scoring Valero Alamo Bowl? Coach Sark was a, a, a really good quarterback uh, in college, and um, you know it's 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 cool to see because you know sometimes we'll we'll see the same things and we'll see different things, kind of talk about it, um, and it's it's awesome because he he has great input on you know on everything I do, and obviously he's been there, he's done it. Uh, but yeah, like you said, this is a it'll be a cool game for for him and a couple other coaches that came from Washington. Um, you know, it should be a fun experience overall, and um, you know I'm not going to predict anything, but it should be a fun game. On the flip side, Washington is practicing at the University of the Incarnate Word. The Huskies offense is getting ready to face a Horns defense led by D.C. Pete Kukowski, who was the Huskies defensive coordinator from 2018 to 2020 before joining Texas in 2021. I played against the defense and I played with uh, Coach K as a safety. So I was kind of in between those two different um, time zones. But I remember all the calls. I remember every single call like the back of my hand. I don't forget that stuff. So I think that would be a big advantage for me. I, I, and I, um, if he doesn't switch up the signals, then hey, I might be making a lot more plays than anticipated. <laughs> Take any advantage you can get. Texas and Washington will play football Thursday night at 8 at the Alamo Dome. The Ricos River Rally at the Arneson River Theater on the Riverwalk started today at 5 o'clock. So we'll have that for you tonight on the Night Beat. Always a good party down on the Riverwalk. It is indeed. Thanks, Larry. We'll see you a little bit later tonight. We'll see you on the other side of this break with a case and Explains. What's in your bin? We're talking recycling and organics in this case that explains if you have them, you fill up those bins, hoping that you're doing a good thing, reducing waste and helping the environment. But can what you toss in there actually be reused or does it just get tossed in the trash somewhere else along the way? Here's Myra Arthur for case that explains what's in the bin. You toss it in here, hoping it doesn't wind up here. And here is where that's decided, the Republic Services Processing Plant. They take in all the recyclables for City of San Antonio customers. This is Tim Tiemann. I'll explain more when we get up there. Operations manager of the facility, where an average of 400 tons of unwanted stuff arrives every day. So we have to process at least 215 or more tons a day per shift to stay in front of that. So you're looking at 430 tons. First, a load of recyclables is weighed, then dumped. Our loader operators blend the material, fluff it. Yes, fluff it. It's to help separate the items so they can be sorted more easily. On the pre-sort line, these employees are removing what will not be recycled and will be sent to a landfill. They have to remove 45 unwanted items per minute to stay on pace. It goes into screening process where the cardboard and the glass are taken out. Then after the screening process of the cardboard and the glass, it goes into the optical sorting area where the papers are taken out. So what makes the cut? Tiemann calls it the core four. You got paper, cardboard, bottles and cans. That's your core fours that you want to have in your system. Not only because those things can be reused, but because someone wants to reuse it. These items are processed and then sold to mills. It's not only what can be recycled, it's what there is a market for to be for that material itself. Somebody's got to want that used material. So there are some things, depending on who wants it, that's the mill, that are recyclable. But if there's not a desire for it, though it may be stamped with a recycle symbol on it, 
you might not have an outlet for it. Tiemann says goods that are recycled need to meet a few requirements. They must be big enough for the machines to process or capture. If it's smaller than a business card, we're probably not going to capture it. Okay. And items need to be clean. Well, they'll reject the material or they'll downgrade it. Now, something that happens if if it down, they downgrade it, they can send it back to us. So we pay for the freight for that truck to come back here. Plus, we have to figure out what's wrong with the material, reprocess it yet again, and try to sell it again. So that's double cost in that product. What are some of the reasons that a bale may be downgraded or rejected? Uh, contamination. Contamination being too much plastic bags for their straining system, diapers, believe it or not, some type of a medical waste. We wanted to put a few things to the test. We're going to start with an easy one. Sure, yes. How about uh, this? Yes. Strawberry container. These clamshells, they can be if, if they're clean. How about this? I'll say yes to that, but if you bring me a Raid can or a uh, Coleman propane bottle about that size, I'll tell you no because it's combustible. How about this small little cap? Leave it on. Leave it on. No. Why not? Well, uh, look inside it. There's peanut butter in there. Would you want that? Not here. <laughs> <laughs> it's because of the contamination on the inside. It makes it very hard for us to process. But if I cleaned this. You cleaned it, yes. And I could leave the paper on Absolutely. here. Absolutely. And the top. Absolutely. All right, dry cleaning bag. Okay, capture rate. Remember what we're trying to do, we're trying to capture clean. So no, we really don't want that in our stream if it's a big city stream like ours because we can't capture it, it's gonna get contaminated because people are not as clean as everybody else. We, we could capture the lid, but, but maybe not the container. How about magazines? Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, now if it's truly that thin glaze, you think this is cardboard, right? Yes. It yes. is kind of a corrugation, but it's, 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 you can see it, so yes, we can capture it, so you can put it in there, as long as it, that's all you throw in there. You don't throw the inner in there, too. Okay. Because then we have to separate that inner from the cardboard. We'd rather you separate the inner and the cardboard, put them separately, and we'll capture them separately. Okay. Okay, so the plastic bag that my football set came no. in, that's got to be gone. Yeah. I didn't do a dirty one because I'm not going to do that to you, but let's pretend. No. No. Please no. But it happens. It happens a lot. Aha. No. Because we can't capture it. Because it's too small. It's too small and it's, 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 it's a plastic, it's a low grade plastic. They don't want it. All of these. Even if I'm neat about it and I bag them all up so that they're sizable. It comes down to that old, can we, can we, what can we do with plastic bags? Unfortunately, the market right now is not really wanting plastic bags. You're a city customer, you're allowed to do this. That's my best way of answering that question. If you're a city of San Antonio customer, this is the way they tell you to do it, do it. This. No. Okay, how do I clean a paper plate? You can't. So I just put it in the trash. Right, now the city of San Antonio has a third container. What's that for? Organics. Organics. What's in the organics bin is brought here. 15, 20 to 50, 100 trucks a day. So what goes in San Antonio's green bins? It could be grass clippings, tree trimmings, brush, also food waste. Those are organics. If it was once living or now dead, or if you can eat it, and it's food waste, those are considered organics. Just like at the recycling facility, plastic bags are no good here either. Let's say you're cutting your grass and you don't mulch it, you want to bag your grass. So you take those grass clippings, you put them into a plastic bag, and you put that plastic bag in your green bin. Oh great, I organically recycled. Technically you didn't. The grass clippings are good, but the plastic is not good. What is accepted here is also sold to customers in the form of compost. Compost is an organic material that provides nutrition back to Mother Nature where she once gave us that material from. First, the organic material is shredded. Alrighty, LJ, let's put a couple buckets in there, my man. Then the load is sent through a trommel screen or a big drum. So in that drum, anything that's spinning around mm -hmm. that is underneath that one inch mm -hmm. diameter will get tossed out. Yes. Then it's up to the sorting line where non-organic items get tossed out. We're looking for plastic, metals, glass, rocks, anything non-biodegradable, non-compostable. These human spotters also have robotic backups. 
artificial intelligence technology using cameras and computers to pick out what doesn't belong. It happens all the time. I, I may not be as fast as I always like to think I am, but there are times where I will miss it and the robot will pick it right up. I've seen weed eaters, pieces of lawnmowers, rims, hubcaps, a bunch of different of everything. But that, of course, is not what makes good compost. It's stuff like this. 50 to 60 tons of food waste is dumped here daily. You can buy cut up fruit and cut up vegetables or even steamables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts in a bag. A lot of that food waste material that doesn't make it to HEB or local grocery store chains comes here. This huge pile of food scraps provides one of two key ingredients for compost, nitrogen. So you need a carbon source, which is your green waste, your grass clippings, tree trimmings. And you also need a food waste stream. That's what makes a good high quality compost, carbon and nitrogen. Food waste material, otherwise known as food scraps, provide a good source of nitrogen, whereas green waste provides carbon. The piles sit for up to two months where they cure and mature until the compost is ready. Last year alone, we diverted 67,000 tons. So by doing this, we're reducing the amount of trash and good material going to landfill. And that's the goal when it comes to organics and recyclables. Yes, one man's trash is hopefully something someone else is willing to pay for. But the hope is also that the environment isn't charged nearly as much. Fascinating stuff. We put even more items to the test to see if they can be recycled. You can watch the full video by scanning this QR code to take you right to the KSAT Explains webpage on our website. We'll be right back.